Hello there dude, so why bother learning OpenGL? Because OpenGL is a 3D graphics API which means you'll be able to create your own absolutely awesome 3D games and graphics which will far exceed anything you've ever done before with 2D graphics and so if you're coming from a 2D graphics programming background then this is the perfect tutorial series for you to make a move towards mastering 3D graphics. Don't get me wrong, 2D games programming is awesome but once you get stuck into 3D games programming you'll never look back. As a comparison, I'm going to compare my 2D Pac-Man game with my 3D Flight Simulator and I'll try to give you my own perspective on how it felt to me as I approached each challenge and roughly how I see the difference between 2D and 3D games programming. So the first thing I remember feeling when I started to learn Allegro, which is the programming library I use for my Pac-Man game, is overwhelmed, which I think is because I'd never used a compiler before and I'd never installed libraries or anything like that. And now just consider for a moment that for 2D games programming, it's just these few lines of code that we need to get our graphics up and running. So that's just a single function call to create an empty image format and another function call to load the image. And then after clearing the screen, we simply specify where we want the top left corner of the image to appear, which in this case is the top left corner of the screen. And that's it. We can do the same thing for a character, which obviously is going to take up less space than the whole of the screen. The only difference is we just simply load the different image and specify the size and we give the X and Y value of where we want the character, in this case Pac-Man, to appear on screen. So that's the entirety of what we need to do to get 2D graphics up and running on the screen. Having said that, where it can get seriously challenging is the game physics, which all depends on what you're trying to make happen. For me, programming this Pac-Man game, I'd say that roughly 95% of the difficulty was in the game's physics, especially the create your own maze feature, because it requires storing all the maze bricks in a vector list in a grid format, and then cycling through that list during the collision detection processes. Now, obviously there's more physics going on than just drawing custom mazes and collision detection, but the rest of the physics is kind of just more of the same thing. So the big takeaway from all this is just two things. First is that to draw 2D graphics is essentially nothing more than just loading images and specifying where on screen you want the images to appear. And second is that the game's physics have the potential to become incredibly complicated depending on what you're trying to do. And so how does all that compare to 3D graphics programming? Just to give you a quick taster, here's a glimpse of my OpenGL Quick Start series tutorials, much of which we'll be covering in this beginner series. I'll show you what 3D graphics programming looks like in just a moment, but as you can see here, by the time we've finished, you'll be able to create skybox worlds, lighting and shadows. You'll be able to produce cool animations, work with animated 3D text, and you'll even learn how to cast rays in 3D space. When you think about it, it's obvious that we can't just slap images onto the screen like we do for 2D graphics because in 3D graphics the images are being rotated round in 3D space because they're slapped onto the objects in 3D space and the objects in 3D space are being rotated around and moving everywhere so therefore so are the images so hence we can't just slap them onto the screen like we can for 2D. That means we've also now got the z-axis which is into screen in addition to the left right x-axis and up down y axis and so this is where the graphics pipeline comes into play the good news is we can still get something to display on screen in 3d without causing our heads to explode which is something you'll learn how to do during this OpenGL for the absolute beginner series but for now just to give you a glimpse this is roughly what we have to do when rendering 3d graphics similar to 2d graphics we also have to load an image like so so yeah, it's a little more than just the two lines of code required for 2D graphics, but it's not that much more. And we basically just load the image, pass the image data to OpenGL, and then use its texture ID to refer to the image and do crazy things with it. Now, let's say we want to draw a cube so that we can spin it around in 3D space. We need to enter its X, Y, and Z dimensions like so. 
Keep in mind that everything in 3D graphics is made up of triangles, and so by specifying three points, such as 1, 0 and 5, which is this point, this point and this point, we've then successfully defined part of our 3D mesh. Now, we do need to ask OpenGL to store that data in memory so that we can do cool things with it. Don't let this put you off, seriously, it's easier than it looks. Like I said, we're just storing the cube's vertex data into memory so that OpenGL can use it, which is essentially just these two lines. We store the vertices in an array buffer and the indices in an element array buffer, but that's basically it. So, to recap then, we've looked at how to load an image, how to enter a model's vertex data into arrays, and how OpenGL stores that data inside memory buffers in order to render it to the screen. Now let's see what that looks like when we put it all into action. In this demo, I've actually used the cube vertex data multiple times, which is really easy to do, and so we've got multiple cubes spinning around all over the place in 3D space. But hang on a minute, what causes the cubes to spin around and move through 3D space? How is it that they're doing that? We haven't done anything to make that happen yet. In OpenGL, translate simply means move. So we use this line for moving a model and this line for rotating a model. And we can do all sorts of other cool stuff simply by combining transformations together. But there's something else we have in 3D graphics, which is a camera. And just like any other camera, we need to decide on the perspective of the viewport. And so we have these two lines. So let's consider the view we can see on screen now to be the camera's default view, but we want to see the plane from the camera's point of view as represented in red. To do that, we simply move and rotate the plane accordingly. And now just to make sure both views are the same, let's compare both views side by side. And there we go. Now, there's just one last thing I need to show you before you can consider yourself to be a 3D games programming super genius. Have you ever heard of shaders? Shaders are actually just little text files of computer code like everything you've seen so far, but the big difference is they live and run directly on your graphics card, which means it's your GPU that runs them instead of your CPU. Now shaders are nothing to be afraid of as you'll see once we start working with them, but before I show you what they look like, here's another demonstration from my RC simulator just to show you what we can do with them. Remember me showing you how in 3D graphics, everything is made of triangles and the triangles themselves are constructed from the vertex data that we pass to OpenGL. Well, by manipulating that vertex data directly inside the vertex shader, we can make silly things happen like bending helicopter blades a really large amount in an attempt to make it take off. And with the assistance of the fragment shader, we can play around with the transparency to produce different results. Here's another example. So once again, by manipulating the vertex data, I managed to work out how to deform the landing skids. Now I won't show you every single line, but for simple shaders, it goes roughly like this. We need just two shaders, so we create one of each, our vertex shader and our fragment shader. This is the example of our vertex shader, so all the things that you've understood so far, which were set upon the CPU side, we can now see working together here on the graphics card. We've got the cubes vertex data just here, the translation and rotations just here, this is the camera view and perspective, and then simply by multiplying all those things together, the graphics pipeline, which is working for us under the hood of OpenGL, outputs our models, which in this case are the cubes, to the fragment shader to be coloured in. So basically the cubes with no images applied to them are automatically sent to the fragment shader, which looks like this. Now that we're in the fragment shader, the only thing we have to do is access the part of the image that the particular triangle or fragment corresponds to, and then the texture function will take care of it for us. So it's just a single line of code. It does take a few more lines to get the lighting up and running and getting the shadows to work can be really tricky, but that's why we'll be taking it one step at a time as we progress. So if you fancy learning more about 3D games programming, then please watch the rest of this series and don't forget you can ask me anything, there's no such thing as a silly question, and don't forget to say the magic words, which are... GL Draw Elements Now we're in the fragment shader, the only thing we have to do is access the part of the image that the particular triangle or fragment corresponds to. <laughs> 